Hi guys, welcome back to my channel. Uh, I'm going to be staying behind the camera for this series uh, as we go through the material for the Law of One. I'm really excited to bring you guys this material and I want to go through it uh, step by step with you, but I will always put in the description uh, of each video of when the actual reading starts because it's very long and I'm going to break it up into several sections and I will be giving a intro and a recap for each section. So this is for the intro which is extremely important. It's almost half of the first book of just the intro. So I do suggest that you listen to all of it. Don't just jump right into the actual conversations with Ra. Uh, I would really listen to all the backstory of the people involved during these sessions. Now, when I first discovered uh, the Law of One and Ra, I completely, I'd already had my awakening and I knew a lot of what uh, was being said from different sources. And even though this one was probably done first, uh, this material was out first, I just simply didn't know about it. I was listening to, you know, Dolores Cannon's work and her books. So the more and more things like this I discover and when it resonates with me and having the knowing uh, for things that are true and then being able to get my own downloads... Um, from different sources. As soon as I started going over this material, it was clear as day and it was very, it was just so interesting. And I'm really excited to just to bring you all this material because I had a hard time uh, finding it anywhere else on YouTube. Um, and so I, I would read it personally myself, but actually I'm not a very good reader and my voice will start cracking and it just won't it might just take me too long and I don't want to spend like a year reading all these books uh, on tape for you. So I will have a little bit of help with the reading. But um, at the end of each session, we are going to go through almost like the lessons uh, so I can kind of break down my take on on things of things that I've gotten as downloads from the Akasha records and what I can merge with other material that I've gone through. So I hope you join me on this journey as we go through the law of one. This is going to be book one and uh, let's get into the intro and I'll see you at the end of this segment. Thanks guys. Introduction. Don Elkins. This book is an exact transcript from tape recordings of 26 sessions of an experiment designed to communicate with an extraterrestrial being. We started the experiment in 1962 and refined the process for 19 years. In 1981 the experimental results of our efforts changed profoundly in quality and precision. This book is simply a report of the beginning of this latter phase of our work. Since our experimental work began, and even before we officially formed a research group, there was considerable confusion about the nature of our research. I would like to state that I consider my point of view to be purely scientific. Many readers of this material have used as a basis for its evaluation a previously assumed philosophical bias which has ranged from what I would call objectively scientific to subjectively theological. It is not the purpose of our research group to attempt to do anything other than make experimental data available. Each reader will undoubtedly reach his own unique conclusion about the meaning of this body of data. In recent years there has been much controversy about phenomena that were apparently incompatible with accepted methods of scientific research. This included such things as UFOs, mental metal bending, psychic surgery, and many other seemingly miraculous happenings. To prove or disprove any of these alleged phenomena is certainly not properly the task of the casual observer. However, most of the public opinion that has been generated with respect to these events seems to be the product of quick and superficial investigation. After almost 30 years of research and experimentation in the area of so-called paranormal phenomena, I must recommend extreme caution in reaching a conclusion. If it is possible to make money, gain notoriety, or have fun from perpetrating a hoax, then someone usually does it. Consequently, paranormal or psychic areas are prime targets for the trickster, and the careful researcher usually has to observe copious amounts of garbage data in order to find a possible embedded gem of truth. This is especially true of Philippine psychic surgery and the large area of spirit communication in general. It seems to me that the presently accepted scientific paradigm is less than adequate. It is my opinion that our present natural philosophy is a very special case of a much more general case yet to be unveiled. 
It is my hope that our research is in the direction of this discovery. After assimilating several million words of alleged extraterrestrial communication, it is also my opinion that this book and the subsequent volumes of the raw material contain the most useful information that I have discovered. As a result of all of this delving into the rather confusing subjects of ufology and parapsychology, I, of course, have formed my current opinion of how things really are. This opinion may change at any time as I become aware of future information. This book is not intended to be a treatise of my opinion, so I will not attempt to defend its validity. The following is the best guess I can make about what we think we are doing. Only time will tell as to the accuracy of this guess. Our research group uses what I prefer to call tuned trans telepathy to communicate with an extraterrestrial race called Ra. We use the English language because it is known by Ra. In fact, Ra knows more of it than I do. Ra landed on Earth about 11,000 years ago as a sort of extraterrestrial missionary with the objective of helping Earthman with his mental evolution. Failing in this attempt, Ra retreated from the Earth's surface but continued to monitor activities closely on this planet. For this reason Ra is highly informed about our history, languages, etc. Probably the most difficult thing to understand about Ra is its nature. Ra is a sixth density social memory complex. Since Earth is near the end of the third density cycle of evolution, this means that Ra is three evolutionary cycles ahead of us. In other words, Ra's present state of evolution is millions of years in advance of Earthman's. It is not surprising that Ra had difficulty communicating with Earthman 11,000 years ago. The same problem still exists in our present enlightened time. At this writing we have completed over 100 sessions of experimental communications with Ra. This approximate 300,000 words of information has suggested to me a possibly more adequate scientific paradigm. Only time and future will serve to validate and expand this paradigm. Ufology is a large subject. A reasonable amount of background material would swell this introduction to book length. Therefore, the remainder of this introduction does not attempt to cover every portion of this diverse and growing field of study but is instead an accounting of some of the pertinent parts of our research from our beginnings to the present day in the raw. Contact. I've asked my longtime research associate, Carla L. Rugert, to tell our story. Carla L. Rugert, I first met Don Elkins in 1962. To me he was a fascinating character, an unusual combination of a college professor and psychic researcher. He had done well over 200 hypnotic age regressions, probing past the birth experience and investigating the possibility that reincarnation might not be just possible but the way things really are. In 1962 I joined an experiment that Don had created in order to start to test a hypothesis which he had developed with the help of Harold Price, an engineer for Ford Motor Company. Price had acquainted Don with some information which Don found quite interesting. Its source was allegedly extraterrestrial. Its content was largely metaphysical and seemed to be in line with all that Don had learned up to that point. Within this material instructions were given for creating the means whereby to generate further material from this same source without the necessity of actual physical contact with extraterrestrials. Don's hypothesis was that this phenomenon might be reproducible, so... He invited a dozen of his engineering students to join in an experiment with the objective of achieving some sort of telepathic contact with a source similar to that of the Detroit groups. I was the 13th member, having become interested in the project through a friend of mine. In those early days of contact attempts, with Don attempting strenuously to keep the situation controlled, months went by with what seemed to be remarkable but puzzling results. As we sat meditating, According to the instructions, everyone in the group except me began to make strange noises with their mouths. For my part, my main difficulty during those first six months was keeping a straight face and not laughing as the sessions gradually became a raucous symphony of guttural clicks, slurps, and tongue flops. The nature of the experiment changed drastically when the group was visited by a contactee from Detroit. The contactee sat down with the group and almost immediately was contacted apparently by telepathic impression saying, why don't you speak the thoughts that are on your minds? We are attempting to use you as instruments of communication, but you are all blocked through fear that you will not be speaking the proper words. Through this instrument, Walter Rogers of Detroit, Michigan, the group was instructed to refrain from analysis, to speak the thoughts and to analyze the communication only after it had been completed. After that night a month had not gone by before half the group had begun to produce information. By the time a year had passed, all in the group except me were able to receive transmissions. The speech was slow and difficult at first because each individual wanted a precise impression of each and every word, and, in many cases, 
wanted to be completely controlled for fear of making an error in transmission. Nevertheless, this was an exciting time for the original group of students who began this strange experiment. In January of 1970 I left my position as school librarian of a 13-grade private school here in Louisville and went to work for Don full-time. By this time he was convinced that the great mystery of being could best be investigated by research into techniques for contacting extraterrestrial intelligences and was determined to intensify his efforts in this area. During this period, Don worked on many peripheral areas of UFO research, always trying to put the puzzle pieces together. One of the great puzzle pieces for us was the question of how UFOs could materialize and dematerialize. The phenomenon seemed to posit a physics which we had not yet grasped and of being capable of using this physics. Don had gone to many seances by himself before I joined him in his research and had very systematically crossed each name off his list. He was looking for a materialization manifestation, not one he could prove to anyone else, but one which he, himself, could believe. It was his feeling that the materializations which seances manifest were perhaps of the same or similar nature as the materializations of UFOs. Therefore, his reasoning went, viewing personally the mechanism of a materialization and a dematerialization in a seance would enable him to hypothesize more accurately concerning UFOs. In 1971, after I had been on several fruitless materialization medium searches with Don, we went to a seance held by the Reverend James Tingley of Toledo a minister of the Spiritualist Church. We went to see Reverend Tingley's demonstrations four times. Before the first time, Don had casually examined Reverend Tingley's modest meeting place inside and out. It was built of concrete blocks, like a garage. There were no gadgets either inside or outside the building. I did not know that Don was doing this. I merely sat and waited for the demonstration to begin. This last point is an important one when talking about psychic research of any kind. Don has always said that one of my assets as a research associate is my great gullibility. Almost anyone can play a joke on me because I do not catch on quickly. I have a way of taking things as they come and accepting them at face value and only afterwards analyzing what has occurred. This gullibility is a vital factor in obtaining good results in paranormal research. A desire for proof will inevitably lead to null results and voided experiments. An open mind, one willing to be gullible leads its possessor to a kind of subjective and personal certainty which does not equal proof as it cannot be systematically reproduced in others. However, this subjective knowing is a central part of the spiritual evolution to which Ra speaks so compellingly in this volume and which we have researched for many years now. The seance began, as do all the seances I have attended, with the repetition of the Lord's Prayer and the singing of hymns such as Rock of Ages and I walked in the garden. There were approximately 26 people in the spear room, sitting on straight chairs in an oval circle. Reverend Tingley had retired behind a simple curtain and was also seated on a folding chair. Of the occurrences of the first seance, perhaps the most interesting to me was the appearance of a rather solid ghost known as Sister. She wished to speak to me and to thank me for helping Don. Since I had never had a close friend that was a nun, I was quite puzzled. It was not until much later, when Don was flying us home, that he jogged my memory, and I realized that his mother, who had died before I met her, was known in the family as sister. Both in that seance, and in the following seance, when Don and I were called up, we could see the ghost-like figures of the materialized spirits quite clearly. I, with impaired night vision, could still make out features, but Don could see even the strands of hair on each entity. During the second seance an especially inspiring master appeared suddenly and the room grew very cold. He gave us an inspirational message and then told us that he would touch us so that we would know that he was real. He did so, with enough force to bruise my arm. Then he told us that he would walk through us so that we would know that he was not of this density. This he did, and it is certainly an interesting sensation to watch this occur. Lifting his arms, he blessed all those in the room, walked back through us, and pulled down in a small pool on the floor and was gone. In 1974 Don decided that it was time for me to become a more serious student of the art of channeling. He argued that 12 years of sitting and listening to inspirational messages were enough, and that it was time for me to take some responsibility for those cosmic sermonettes, as Brad Steiger has called them, that I so enjoyed. We began a series of daily meetings designed to work intensively on my mental tuning. Many of those who were coming to our meditations on Sunday nights heard about the daily meetings and also came, and within three months we generated about a dozen new telepathic receivers. During the process of these intensive meditations we instituted our long-standing habit of keeping the tape recorder going whenever we started a session. 
Using some of the large body of material that our own group had collected, I put together an unpublished manuscript, Voices of the Gods, which systematically offered the extraterrestrial viewpoint as recorded by our group meetings. In 1976, when Don and I began to write Secrets of the UFO, published by a private printing and available by mail, this unpublished manuscript was of great help. During this period one other thing occurred that was synchronistic. Don and I, who had officially gone into partnership as LL Research in 1970, had written an unpublished book titled The Crucifixion of Esmeralda Sweetwater in 1968. In 1974, Andriha Puharaj published a book with Doubleday titled Dury. The book is the narrative of Dr. Puharaj's investigation of Uri Geller and their unexpected communication with extraterrestrial intelligences. The form of contact was quite novel in that first some object like an ashtray would levitate, signaling Dr. Puharaj to load his cassette tape recorder. The recorder's buttons would then be depressed by some invisible force and the machine would record. On playback, a message from an extraterrestrial source would be present. Don was impressed by the large number of correlations between these messages and our own research. The book is fascinating in its own right but it was especially fascinating to us because of the incredible number of distinct and compelling similarities between the characters in the real-life journal of Dr. Puharaj's work with Uri and the supposedly fictional characters in our book. We went to New York to meet Andriha after phoning him, sharing our long-standing research with him and comparing notes. As our genial host came out onto his front veranda to welcome us, I stopped, amazed, to look at the house. Even the house in which he lived in the country north of New York City was a dead ringer for the house his fictional counterpart had owned in our book. The identity was so close that I could not help but ask, Andriha, what happened to your peonies? When I wrote about your house I saw your driveway circled with peony bushes. Piharich laughed, oh, those. I had those cut down three years ago. In 1976 we determined to attempt an introduction to the whole spectrum of paranormal phenomena which are involved in the so-called UFO contactee phenomenon. This phenomenon is not a simple one. Rather, it demands a fairly comprehensive understanding and awareness of several different fields of inquiry. Since the raw material is a direct outgrowth of our continuous research with alleged extraterrestrial entities, it seems appropriate here to review some of the concepts put forward in that book in order that the reader may have the proper introduction to the mindset, which is most helpful for an understanding of this work. The first thing to say about the UFO phenomenon is that it is extraordinarily strange. The serious researcher, as he reads more and more and does more and more field research, finds himself less and less able to talk about the UFO phenomenon in a sensible and down-to-earth way. Well over half the people in the United States have said in nationwide polls that they believe that UFOs are real, and television series and motion pictures reflect the widespread interest in this subject. Yet, there are few researchers who would pretend to be able to understand the phenomenon completely. Dr. J. Allen Hynek has called this quality of the research the high strangeness factor and has linked the amount of high strangeness with the probable validity of the case. Some of the people who see UFOs have the experience of being unable to account for a period of time after the encounter. The UFO is seen and then the witness continues on with his or her daily routine. At some point, it is noticed that a certain amount of time has been lost that cannot be explained. Very often these same people report a type of eye irritation, or conjunctivitis, and sometimes skin problems. In extreme cases, a person who has lost time in seeing a UFO will develop a change of personality and find it necessary to contact the aid of a psychologist or a psychiatrist for counseling. Dr. R. Leo Sprinkle, professor of psychology at the University of Wyoming, has been conducting yearly meetings of people who have experienced this type and other types of close encounters. It was in psychiatric therapy that one of the more famous of the UFO contact cases, that of Betty and Barney Hill, was researched. The Hills had seen a UFO and had lost some time but managed to reduce the significance of these events in their minds enough to get on with their daily lives. However both of them, over a period of months, began experiencing nightmares and attacks of anxiety. The psychiatrist to whom they went for help was one who often used regressive hypnosis for therapeutic work. He worked with each of the couple separately and found, to his amazement, that, when asked to go back to the source of their distress, both Mr. and Mrs. Hill related the story of being taken on board a UFO while on a drive, medically examined, and returned to their car. Don and I have, through the years, investigated quite a few interesting cases, but, perhaps a description of one will suffice to show some of the more outstanding strangenesses which are quite commonly associated with what Dr. Hynek calls close encounters of the third kind. 
In January 1977, merely 18 or so hours after our witnesses' UFO experience, we were called by a friend of ours, hypnotist Lawrence Allison. Lawrence had been contacted by the witness's mother, who was extraordinarily concerned about her boy. We made an appointment with the witness, a 19-year-old high school graduate employed as a truck driver. He had seen a craft about 40 feet long and 10 feet tall, which was the color of the setting sun, at very low altitude, approximately 100 to 150 feet. The craft was so bright that it hurt his eyes, yet he could not remove his gaze from it. He experienced a good deal of fear and lost all sense of actually driving his car. When he was directly underneath the UFO it suddenly sped away and disappeared. When the boy arrived home, his mother was alarmed because his eyes were entirely bloodshot. He was able to pinpoint his time lost since he had left precisely when a television program ended and since he noticed the time of his arrival home. He had lost 38 minutes of his life. The young man wished to try regressive hypnosis to find his lost time. We agreed, and, after a fairly lengthy hypnotic induction, the proper state of concentration was achieved and the witness was moved back to the point at which he was directly underneath the UFO. Suddenly he was inside the ship in a circular room which seemed at least twice as high as the entire ship had seemed from the outside. He saw three objects, none of which looked human. One was black, one was red, and one was white. All looked like some sort of machine. Each entity seemed to have a personality, although none spoke to the boy, and he endured a kind of physical examination. After the examination was finished the machines merged into one and then disappeared. The ship bounced and rocked briefly and then the witness was back in his car. If you are interested in reading a full account of this case, it was published in the APRO Bulletin, in Flying Saucer Review, in the International UFO Reporter, and in the MUFON UFO News. One of the most familiar aspects of close encounters is the experience that our witness had of seemingly understanding what aliens were thinking and feeling without any speech having taken place. Telepathic communication has long been the subject of much experimentation and, although there is much interesting research, there has never been a definitive study proving good telepathic communication. Consequently, the field of research into telepathy is still definitely a fringe area of psychic research. However, anyone who has ever known that the phone was going to ring, or has experienced the knowledge of what someone was going to say before it was said, has experienced at least a mild example of telepathy. Don states that telepathic experiments between himself and Dory Geller have been totally successful. However, since they were deliberately not performed under rigorous scientific control, they could not be included in any orthodox report. It is, in fact, our opinion that the rigorous controls have a dampening effect on the outcome of any experiment of this type. LL Research, which, since 1980, has been a subsidiary of the Rock Creek Research and Development Labs, to this day holds weekly meetings open to anyone who has read our books. We still tend to insert the word alleged. Before the words telepathic communications from extraterrestrials because, we know full well that there is no way of proving this basic concept. However, the phenomenon certainly exists. Millions of words in our own files and many millions of words in other groups' files attest to this fact. Regardless of the more than occasional frustrations involved in paranormal research, the serious researcher of the UFO phenomenon needs to be persistent in his investigation of related phenomena, such as mental metal bending. The physics which Ra discusses, having to do with the true nature of reality, posits the possibility of action at a distance as a function of mind, specifically the will. Ori Geller has been tested in several places around the world, including the Stanford Research Laboratories, and an impressive list of publications concerning the results of those tests exists, most notably the Geller Papers and, as an offshoot of this metal-bending phenomenon, the Iceland Papers. One example which shows the close connection between UFOs and mental metal bending happened to us in July of 1977, after our book, Secrets of the UFO, was published. We had been interviewed on a local program and a woman in a nearby town had heard the broadcast and was very interested in what we had to say since her son, a normal 14-year-old boy, had had a UFO encounter. He had been awakened by a whistling sound, went to the door, and saw a light so bright that it temporarily blinded him. Again. As is often the case, it was the same night that people nearby also saw lights in the sky. The woman wrote us a letter, and Don immediately called and asked her permission to speak to her son. After questioning the young man to Don's satisfaction, Don asked him to take a piece of silverware and tell it to bend without touching it in any firm or forceful way. The 14-year-old picked up a fork, did as Don suggested, and the fork immediately bent nearly double. 
The boy was so startled that he would not come back to the phone, and his mother was unable to convince him that there was any value in going further with the experiments. She had enough foresight to realize that in the small town in which he lived any publicity that might come to him on the subject of metal bending would be to his detriment, since the people of his small town would react in a most predictable way. Nevertheless, the link is there quite plainly. John Taylor, professor of mathematics at King's College, London, offered his book, Superminds, to make his careful experimentations on metal bending available to the world. Taylor used only children, about 50 of them, and for a great portion of his experiment he used metal and plastic objects sealed in glass cylinders which had been closed by a glass blower, so that the children could not actually touch the objects without breaking the glass. Under this controlled circumstance the children were still able to bend and break multitudinous objects. As you read the raw material you will begin to discover why it is mostly children that are able to do these things, and what the ability to do this has to do with the rest of the UFO message. Since I am not a scientist, at this point I will turn the narrative back to Don, whose background is more suited to this discussion. Don, a persistent question when considering psychic demonstrations is, how does the paranormal event happen? The answer may well lie in the area of occult theory, which is concerned with the existence of various planes. After death an individual finds himself at one of these levels of existence spoken of in connection with occult philosophy, the level of being dependent on the spiritual nature or development of the person at the time of his death. The cliché that covers this theory is a heavenly birds of a feather flock together. When a ghost materializes into our reality, it is from one of these levels that he usually comes for his earthly visit. In general, it is theorized that a planet is a sort of spiritual distillery. With reincarnation taking place into the physical world until the individual is sufficiently developed in the spiritual sense that he can reach the higher planes of existence, and is no longer in need of this planet's developmental lessons. Most of this theory was developed as a result of reported contact and communication with the inhabitants of these supposedly separate realities. I have come to believe that these levels interpenetrate with our physical space and mutually coexist, though with very little awareness of each other. A simple analogy, to which I've referred before, is to consider the actors in two different TV shows, both receivable on the same set, but each show being exclusive of the other. This seems to be what we experience in our daily lives, one channel or density of existence, being totally unaware of the myriad entities occupying other frequencies of our physical space. The point of all this is that our reality is not ultimate or singular, it is, in fact, our reality only at the present. Many of the UFO reports display ample evidence that the object sighted has its origin in one of these other realities or densities, just as do the materialized ghosts. I would like to emphasize that this does not in any way imply their unreality, rather, it displaces the UFO's reality from ours. I'm saying the equivalent of Channel 4 on the TV is equivalent to but displaced from Channel 3 on the same TV. If you were told to build a scale model of any atom using something the size of a pea for the nucleus, it would be necessary to have an area the size of a football stadium to contain even the innermost orbital electrons. If the pea were placed at the center of the 50-yard line, a small cotton ball on the uppermost seat in the stands could represent an electron of the atom. There is very little actual matter in physical matter. When you look at the stars in the night sky, you would probably see something quite similar to what you would see if you could stand on the nucleus of any atom of solid material and look at or toward our environment. To demonstrate an electron to you, a physicist will probably show you a curved trace of one on a photographic plate. What he probably does not tell you is that this is second-hand evidence. The electron itself has never been seen, only its effect on a dense medium can be recorded. It is possible, of course, to make accurate mathematical calculations about what we call an electron. For such work we must know some data on magnetic field strength, electron charge, and velocity. But since a magnetic field is caused by moving charges, which in turn are empirically observed phenomena, we find that the entire mathematical camouflage obscures the fact that all we really know is that charged particles have effects on each other. We still don't know what charged particles are, or why they create an action at a distance effect. Senior scientists would be the first to agree that there is no such thing as an absolute scientific explanation of anything. Science is, rather, a method or tool of prediction, relating one or more observations to each other. In physics, this is usually done through the language of mathematics. Our scientific learning is a learning by observation and analysis of this observation. In the sense of penetrating the fundamental essences of things, we really do not understand anything at all. 
A magnetic field is nothing but a mathematical method of expressing the relative motion between electrical fields. Electrical fields are complex mathematical interpretations of a totally empirical observation stated as Coulomb's law. In other words, our forest of scientific knowledge and explanations is made up of trees about which we understand nothing except their effect, their existence. To a person unfamiliar with the inner workings of modern science, it may seem that modern man has his environment nicely under control and totally figured out. Nothing could be further from the truth. The leaders of science who are researching the frontiers of modern theory argue among themselves continually. As soon as a theory begins to receive wide acceptance as being a valid representation of physical laws, someone finds a discrepancy, and the theory has to be either modified or abandoned entirely. Perhaps the most well-known example of this is Newton's F equals M dot A. This attained the status of a physical law before being found to be an error. It is not that this equation has not proven extremely useful, we have used it to design everything from a moon rocket to the television picture tube, but its accuracy fails when applied to atomic particle accelerators like the cyclotron. To make accurate predictions of particle trajectories it is necessary to make the relativistic correction formulated by Einstein. It is interesting to note that this correction is based on the fact that the speed of light is totally independent of the speed of its source. If Newton had penetrated more deeply into the laws of motion he might have made this relativistic correction himself, and then stated that the velocity correction would always be of no consequence. Since the velocity of light was so much greater than any speed attainable by man. This was very true in Newton's day, but is definitely not the case now. We still tend to think of the velocity of light as a fantastic and unattainable speed. But with the advent of space flight, a new order of velocities has arrived. We have to change our thinking from our normal terrestrial concepts of velocities. Instead of thinking of the speed of light in terms of miles per second, think of it in terms of Earth diameters per second. The almost unimaginable 186,000 miles per second becomes an entirely thinkable 23 Earth diameters per second, or... We could think of the speed of light in terms of our solar system's diameter and say that light would speed at about 2 diameters per day. Einstein's assertion that everything is relative is so apt that it has become a cliché of our culture. Let us continue being relativistic in considering the size of natural phenomena by considering the size of our galaxy. If you look up at the sky on a clear night, nearly all of the visible stars are in our own galaxy. Each of these stars is a sun like our own. A calculation of the ratio of the number of suns in our galaxy to the number of people on planet Earth discovers that there are 60 suns for each living person on Earth today. It takes light over four years to get from Earth to even the nearest of these stars. To reach the most distant star in our own galaxy would take 100,000 light years. These calculations are made using the assumption that light has a speed. This may be an erroneous assumption in the face of new theory, but its apparent speed is a useful measuring tool, so we use it anyway. So we have a creation in which we find ourselves which is so big that at a speed of 23 Earth diameters a second we must travel 100,000 years to cross our immediate backyard. That is a big backyard, and it would seem ample for even the most ambitious of celestial architects, but in truth this entire galaxy of over 200 billion stars is just one grain of sand on a very big beach. There are uncounted trillions of galaxies like ours, each with its own billions of stars, spread throughout what seems to be infinite space. When you think of the mind-boggling expanse of our creation and the infantile state of our knowledge in relation to it, you begin to see the necessity for considering the strong probability that our present scientific approach to investigating these expanses is as primitive as the dugout canoe. The most perplexing problem of science has always been finding a satisfactory explanation of what is called action at a distance. In other words, everyone knows that if you drop something it will fall, but no one knows precisely why. Many people know that electric charges push or pull on each other even if separated in a vacuum, but again no one knows why. Although the phenomena are quite different, the equations which describe the force of interaction are quite similar. For gravitation, F equals GMM apostrophe R2. For electrostatic interaction, F equals KQQ apostrophe R2. The attractive force between our planet and our sun is described by the gravitational equation. The attractive force between orbiting electrons and the atomic nucleus is described by the electrostatic interaction equation. Now each of these equations was determined experimentally. They are not apparently related in any way, and yet they both describe a situation in which attractive force falls off with the square of the distance of separation. A mathematical representation of an action at a distance effect is called a field, such as a gravitational or electric field. 
It was Albert Einstein's foremost hope to find a single relation which would express the effect of both electric and gravitational phenomena, in fact, a theory which would unify the whole of physics, a unified field theory. Einstein believed that this was a creation of total order and that all physical phenomena were evolved from a single source. This unified field theory, describing matter as pure field, has been accomplished now. It seems that the entire situation was analogous to the solution of a ponderously complex Chinese puzzle. If you can find that the right key turns among so many wrong ones, the puzzle easily falls apart. Dewey B. Larson found the solution to this problem, and the puzzle not only fell apart, but revealed an elegantly adequate unified field theory rich in practical results, and, like a good Chinese puzzle, the solution was not complex, just unexpected. Instead of assuming five dimensions, Larson assumed six, and properly labeled them as the three dimensions of space and the three dimensions of time. He assumed that there is a three-dimensional coordinate time analogous to our observed three-dimensional space. The result of this approach is that one can now calculate from the basic postulate of Larson's theory any physical value within our physical universe, from subatomic to stellar. This long-sought-after unified field theory is different because we are accustomed to thinking of time as one-dimensional, as a stream moving in one direction. Yet once you get the hang of it, coordinate time is mathematically a more comfortable concept with which to deal. Professor Frank Meyer of the Department of Physics at the University of Wisconsin presently distributes a quarterly newsletter to scientists interested in Larson's new theory which explores perplexing questions in physical theory using Larson's approach. I was interested in testing Larson's theory and made extensive calculations using his postulate. I became convinced that his theory is indeed a workable unified field theory. I had been pondering several interesting statements communicated through contactees by the alleged UFO source prior to discovering Larson's work in the early 60s. Although the people who had received these communications knew nothing of the problems of modern physics, they were getting information which apparently was quite central to physical theory. First, they suggested that the problem with our science was that it did not recognize enough dimensions. Second, they stated that light does not move, light is... Larson's theory posits six dimensions instead of the customary four, and finds the pure field, which Einstein believed would represent matter, to move outward from all points in space at unit velocity, or the velocity of light. Photons are created due to a vibratory displacement in space-time, the fabric of the field. Furthermore, the contactees were saying that consciousness creates vibration, this vibration being light. The vibratory displacements of space-time in Larson's theory are the first physical manifestation, which is the photon or light. According to the UFO contactees, the UFOs lower their vibrations in order to enter our skies. The entire physical universe postulated by Larson is dependent on the rate of vibration and quantized rotations of the pure field of space-time. The contactees were suggesting that time was not what we think it is. Larson suggests the same thing. The UFOs were said to move in time as we move in space. This would be entirely normal in Larson's time-space portion of the universe. Lastly, and perhaps most importantly, the contactees were receiving the message that the creation is simple, all one thing. Larson's theory is a mathematical statement of this unity. For more information about Larsonian physics, contact the International Society of Unified Science, a group of scientists and philosophers currently promoting Larson's theory. What physicists have never before considered worth investigating is now increasing at a very rapid rate. Action at a distance, apparently as a result of some type of mental activity, seems repeatedly the observed effect. When Uri Geller performs on TV, mentally bending metal and fixing clocks, there are often many kids who try to duplicate Uri's tricks. Sometimes the kids succeed. The number of children that can cause bends and breaks in metal and other materials just by wanting the break or bend to occur is increasing daily. As previously mentioned, John Taylor, professor of mathematics at King's College, reports in his excellent book, Superminds, on the extensive tests run in England on several of these gifted children. If the gallerizing children continue to increase in numbers and ability, the 1980s will see such fantasies of TV as My Favorite Martian, I Dream of Genie, and Bewitched Becoming a Part of Reality. With controlled, repeatable experiments like those conducted by Taylor and by the Stanford Research Institute in the United States, we begin to have good solid data available for study. Gradually we are moving into a position from which we can begin to create a science of magic, for that which has been called magic through the ages is now being performed at an ever-increasing rate, primarily by children. In the future, we may even find this. 
magic added to the curriculum of the sciences at universities. In point of fact, the present disciplines of chemistry, physics, etc., are still basically magic to us, since we are still in the position of having no ultimate explanation of causality. Carla, one of the concepts most central to the system of study which comes out of research into the contactee messages offered by alleged UFO contact is the concept of the immortality of our individual consciousness. There is a long mystical tradition extending back far beyond biblical times, which posits a type of immortal soul. St. Paul in his epistles has distinguished between the human body and the spiritual body. Long before St. Paul's century, Egyptian priests had the concept of the Ka and posited that this Ka, or spiritual personality, existed after death and was the true repository of the essence of consciousness of the person who had lived the life. Egyptians, of course, made very elaborate arrangements for life after death. If life after death is posited as a probability, one may also posit life before birth. Any mother who has more than one child will testify to the undoubted fact that each child comes into his life or incarnation already equipped with a personality which cannot be explained by environment or heredity. After all the factors of both have been accounted for, there remains a unique personality with which the child seems to have been born. Each child has certain fears which are not explainable in terms of the fears of the parents. A child, for instance, may be terrified of a thunderstorm. The rest of the family may be perfectly comfortable during such a storm. Another child may be extraordinarily gifted at the playing of an instrument when neither parent nor any relative as far back as the parents can remember had musical ability. Okay, so that felt like a good place to uh, stop before we go on to part two. The reason why these uh, introductions to this book are so important because it really does lay out the groundwork for the history of where these researchers are coming from and how much work that they did uh, to just bring us this material. Um, it's interesting that they're using the dimensions. Now they call Ra um, a six-dimensional being or extraterrestrial but he actually is just like a being he's basically energy and this will uh be something that i explain more and more as we go on and what it means to be six dimensional opposed to what we are which is three and what it takes to graduate basically to be a six dimensional being because in time over millions of years after we become more educated or experienced in going through the processes of the different dimensions we will eventually graduate to 6d just like Ra. but he or she or that being is simply uh, millions of years ahead not necessarily an extraterrestrial but is simply just a being of energy uh, so it's it's hard to explain what exactly Ra is in human language, but it does become more and more clear as we go through this. But let's continue with the background uh, story of how these researchers uh, found Ra and was able to um, basically interview him. And uh, he was able or she was able to give us so many answers. So let's get into the next lesson.